children up to camp in the minibus yesterday and I thought, oh, all those fields have got the nice long stalks of corn and wheat all ready to be cut. And then when I looked a bit closer, because it's difficult to stop and really have a good look when you're driving, isn't it? I suddenly realised that actually most of the fields had already been cut. And then as we went on to some of the country roads, we had to slow down and follow the tractors with all these great big circular bales of, of straw and wheat and that already cut on their tractors and had to follow them slowly as all of the harvest was brought in. In fact, it took me back a good few years when Michael was still working on the farm. And uh, I, I gave a helping hand driving a, a big tractor and, and trailer, one of those big articulated trailers with those great big rolls of, sorry, you know, they, they each weigh a third of a ton apparently, Michael was telling me and he put them on with a forklift truck and then said, okay, Dad, you go and take it down to the farm. And I don't know about you, have you ever been able to drive and reverse with a trailer on? I've never done it at all in my life. And on top of this, this is an articulated trailer. So I said to Michael, well, what do I do if I meet a quarry lorry? Because the quarry was nearby. He said, don't worry, he'll give way to you. You just keep driving, you'll be all right. So anyway, we did meet a quarry lorry and he gave me a cheery wave and that was okay. So, um, so I just, just brought back memories. And also it just made me think about harvest. And those of us who are believers will recall the fact that there are verses of Scripture with the word harvesting. And so that's what I'm thinking about this evening. And the first verse I'd just like us to think about is in Jeremiah in chapter 8 and verse 20. It's just one verse, so if it's difficult to find, don't, don't bother to re, uh, look it up. It's just simply one verse or part of the verse and I'll read it to you. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20. It's the prophet speaking, and he's speaking about the fact that the nation of Israel, 2,600 years ago or so, had continually disobeyed God, and that God is now going to have to judge them for their disobedience. And we read these words, The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. It's interesting, I was wanting to look at the, the corn and the wheat and everything else ready to harvest and suddenly I realised that actually the harvest on the fields I was looking at was past. It had all been reaped and it had all been taken in and as I said before, everything was in the, the process of being gathered in safely. So the harvest was actually past and I don't think we think summer's ended. It seems very warm at the moment, doesn't it? Warmer than certainly in this part of the world we normally associate with summer. But the prophet is just saying that the nation of Israel 2,600 or so years ago had the opportunity to put matters right with God and they refused to do it. Then suddenly, like the annual cycle in this world of spring or winter and spring and seed time and harvest, suddenly the summer was ended. The time when it was right for them to put matters right with God had gone. It was ended. It was finished. And they weren't saved. And it just got me thinking, you know, God is a loving God. God is a caring God. But there comes a time if we don't put matters right with God, then he says, that's enough. And he will have to punish our wrongdoing. So we see that they had disobeyed God, that God punished or judged them, and it was then too late for them to be saved. So I think we can just get some little lessons here. First of all, disobedience to God is called sin. Some people think that sin is the dreadful murders and all the other awful things we read about in the news or we hear about on the news. That is not the case. Disobedience to God is everything we do from almost the time we're born to the time that we die. As parents, you will have observed parents, they spend all their time trying to teach their children to do the right thing. We never spend our time teaching our children to do the wrong thing. It's something we are born with, this, this innate quality of wanting to tend to do things that are wrong. 
And God has set the standard, and God has a right to set the standard, doesn't he? Because God has made the world, as uh, Philip was mentioning in his prayer, and although man has tried to spoil God's word, man has a responsibility to look after it for him. But God, therefore, has the right to set the standards. And God has said that we should put him first in our lives. And even the most devoted Christian to God would admit to the fact that they haven't put God first in their lives. So God says we should put him first, and everyone's failed there. But what about some of the other things, like God has said we should respect our parents, do what they tell us to do, as long as they tell us to do right things. God has said we shouldn't tell lies. God has said we shouldn't steal. So we see that we don't, we don't escape any of these simple requirements of God. So we can agree with what the Bible says, what God says in his word, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you'll find that in Romans in chapter 3. So we see that actually we're no different to the nation of Israel of old. And God has always said that if people disobey him, then he will have to punish it. You see, when he made Adam and Eve and put them in the Garden of Eden, sin actually hadn't come into the world. And God said to Adam, you can eat of everything in the wonderful garden where he placed them. And Eden means paradise. But he said there's just one fruit tree in the midst of the garden, right in the middle, the Bible says. And he said of that tree you're not to eat. One simple command. And then God said to them, the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. So God warned Adam and Eve that there would be punishment if they disobey him. So it's really quite simple, isn't it? But you see, there came a time when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And although they didn't die immediately, God had to say to them there would be suffering, there would be sickness, there would be difficulties, and eventually, over 900 years later, Adam died. So death came into the world by one man, the Bible tells us, and death by, uh, by sin. And so we see that God keeps his word, and God has that set thing. If we disobey him, then our disobedience will be punished by God. And here's a couple of verses in the scripture just to back that up. In Romans 6, 23, we read that the wages of sin is death. Sin pays wages, as we often say. It also says that it is appointed unto man, that means men, women, boys and girls, wants to die. But after this adjustment, you can read that in Hebrews chapter 9. But Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, then goes on to say, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of of many. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the Lord Jesus Christ, who you may have heard about, came to earth around 2,000 years ago for a very specific purpose, and that specific purpose was to die on the cross of Calvary. And he was different to every other man that had lived. He never did anything wrong. He never sinned. He always pleased God. Isn't that wonderful if you think about it? Even in our thoughts, we often think things we know are wrong. But the Lord Jesus never even thought wrong thoughts because he was God in human form. And of course God, well I say God cannot sin, he can't sin. But the Bible puts it like this, God that cannot lie. And when you think about it, every sin is connected with lying, is connected with, with, with seeking to uh, cover up. And so... Many people will say, well, God can do anything he wants. Actually, God cannot lie, and God cannot sin. And so we need to understand that God is perfect. So his standard that he requires of us is perfection as well. And so we see we cannot keep his standard. And of course, God knows that. And God in his love made it possible for us to escape his punishment, his judgment on our wrongdoing. So how has he done that? Well, Christ, as this verse said, was once offered to bear the sins of many. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, the only way that they could approach God was that something was sacrificed 
that had life in their place. And so you have all these, these, these animal sacrifices you read about down through the Old Testament. And they spoke of the one who was going to sacrifice himself on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because those sacrifices couldn't actually take away sin. They couldn't deal with sin. Because they, just did, they were mindless sacrifices, they were animals just taken. But it was what God's way. Now it might seem strange, and it might seem rather horrible to us, and I understand that, but it was God's way. And we need to understand that God as a creator can say what is right for him, and we have no right to criticise him. And so that was God's way, because it was a picture of one who is called by John the Baptist in the New Testament, the Lamb of God. And so the Lord Jesus Christ came as the final sacrifice for sin. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. The Bible says Christ died for our sins. Now, have you accepted that? Do you believe that? And have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who will save you from God's punishment on your sin? Now I ask that question because you have got to answer that question. You see, the nation of Israel had left it too late to be saved. At the moment, it's not too late for you to be saved. It is still possible to be saved from God's punishment on your sin. And the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in Acts chapter 16. It also says in 2 Corinthians 6 that now, now is the accepted time. Now is the time to put matters right with God. Now is the day of salvation. That means, salvation means to be saved. And so, first of all, you cannot come to me and say, I don't sin, because if God says you sin, I know you sin, I know I sin, I know I disobey God. So I know I need to be saved from God's punishment on my sin. It's still possible for you to be saved if you're not already saved. But it's now. It's the only time we're guaranteed. So that's a past harvest. Right, it was all past. Nothing could be done about it. I couldn't take photos of the lovely stalks of corn and wheat and maize and all those things that were there because the harvest was past. But that doesn't matter too much. You can get lots of pictures of that. But if you leave it too late to be saved, nothing can be put right. So we need to make sure that we're saved from God's judgment on our sin. Now I'd like us all to turn to Matthew and chapter 13. And we're going to be read a, not a past harvest, but now we're going to read a parable. It's a parable about weeds. Matthew and chapter 13. And we'll start reading at verse chapter 24, and we're going to read about a harvest. Now, a parable is a story that the Lord Jesus told that had a meaning. And this is one of the few parables where the Lord Jesus explains what the meaning of the parable is. A lot of them he tells a meaning and he doesn't explain them. He leaves them for us to work out what they are. But this is one of the ones where we'll read the parable and then we'll read the meaning as explained by the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew and chapter 13 and verse 24. Another parable put he forth, that's the Lord Jesus unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while the men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares. That's weeds, a special type of weed, which we'll talk about a little more in a minute. Came and sowed these tares, these weeds, among the wheat, and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up, that means when it started to grow, and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares, these weeds also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it these tares, these weeds? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, no, 
lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. You know what it's like when you pull weeds up? Sometimes if you pull it up whole, it pulls up a bit of the grass or something you don't want to do. And so the person in charge is saying, don't do that because we want the wheat and we don't want to pull the wheat up. So he says in verse 30, let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. And now if we go, go over to verse 36, we see that the disciples demanded of the Lord Jesus that he would explain to them what it meant. So let's read from verse 36. You see, Jesus was talking to lots and lots of people around. That's what the multitude means, lots of people. And we read that Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare, give us a meaning unto us, the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. That's another name for the Lord Jesus Christ. It emphasizes that he became a man when he came to earth. Verse 38, it says, The field is the world. The good seed is are the children of the kingdom. But the tares, or these weeds, are the children of the wicked one. That's the devil. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. That's when he goes on to say, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world, or the age. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, things that he doesn't like, and them which do iniquity, that's deliberate acts of wrongdoing, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That sounds horrible, doesn't it? We'll get a lesson from that. And then we read then finally in verse 43, Then shall the righteous shine forth as a son in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him here. So we've got the picture perhaps of the, what the Lord Jesus is telling us in the parable, the story with a meaning. Sometimes my father used to say an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Well, we sort of get the idea, don't we, when we, we hear that. But it's a story and anyone can tell a parable. As long as it's got a meaning, it becomes a parable. But the Lord Jesus told a lot of parables. And this is in a section about what we call the kingdom parables. And to put it loosely, the kingdom is the sphere where the rule of God or the Lord Jesus is acknowledged or appears to be acknowledged. And let's just have a look and see, because the Lord Jesus explains here, so we don't have to scratch our heads and puzzle over what the meaning might be. So perhaps we just look at the first bit of verse 38. And the Lord Jesus says the field where all of these things were sowed is the world. So we're thinking about the whole world. You know, it did make me think about a verse in the Bible, a well-known verse for those of us who are the Lord's, John 3.16. It said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, or his one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. That means he wouldn't have to perish and suffer this awful judgment we read of in hell. But if he um, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That means go to heaven, have spiritual life, life that fits us for going to heaven. So you see, God is concerned about the world that he made. But he's more concerned about the people in his world. All right, so when it says the field is the world, he's thinking about the people in the world. How many people are in the world today? Well, people suggest it's around 8 billion people. That's a number we cannot get our heads around, can we? In fact, I suspect that when we start talking in terms of thousands, we can't even get our head round 
a number as big as that, millions and that, we just, it's just so difficult to understand. But God knows everyone. And he's known everyone that's ever lived, that he's ever made. And he has a love and a care and a concern for each one of them. So we see, in f first of all, in verse 38, that the field is the world. And then we read that that good seed, that wheat in picture that was sown, are the children of the kingdom. Now some of us know that there is another parable that the Lord Jesus told, and it was about a sower, and that the good seed there was the word of God. And so we've got a slightly different slant here. All right, it's talking about the good seed are the children of the kingdom. Now I'm going to make this very simple. Christians, those who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour, that's a good seed. And we're going to see that um, Christians have been put here to spread the word of God to those all around. So, okay, we've got true Christians. And then we go back to verse 37. And the person that did the sowing, we find out, is he that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to earth and he came so that people could be saved and that people could be there for when he went back to heaven, and they could indeed spread the word of God, the good seed. I'm putting it very simply, all right, so that people could get to know about the Lord Jesus. He is in heaven now. He went back to heaven 2,000 years ago, and so he left those who are his to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he came so that we could be saved. Now let's look and see what else it says in verse 38. It goes on to say that the tares are the children of the wicked one. I said I'd tell you a bit more about these tares, about these weeds, didn't I? Well, these weeds are called darnel, D-A-R-N-E-L. It sounds unusual, but what's special about them was, you see, when the enemy sowed these seeds, it wasn't any old seed. It was a seed that when it starts first to grow, it looks just like wheat and couldn't tell the difference. And you know, it reminds me of something. In what we call the kingdom of God, there are some people who say they're Christians, but they're not. Now please don't ever be like that. Make sure that you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour, and that you're a true Christian. Because there will come a time, as we see, where the Lord Jesus Christ and his servants will realise that there are those that are just pretending to be Christians. Please don't pretend to be a Christian because God knows. And actually a lot of his people come to understand because you see when certain circumstances happen and perhaps life gets difficult, it then shows whether you're a Christian or not, even though you might be pretending. So you see what we read is the tares these things that grow that look originally like the true children of the kingdom suddenly show by the way that they act that they're not. They suddenly become very clear that they're weeds that need to be got rid of. And so this is what the Lord Jesus says about them. He says these tares, these weeds, are the children of the wicked one. Not children of God, not those that have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. But in verse 39, we see that they're children of the devil. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Now, there's no in-between. We're either children of God or we're children of the devil. Now, I know that might sound a bit extreme, but that's quite clear what it says here. There's no in-between. We read in the scriptures elsewhere that whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. And so the scriptures are very black and white on this. So we need to make sure that we are children of God and not children of the devil. In other words, we're either saved from God's judgment or we're not saved from God's judgment. And there's no in between. Now we go on to verse 39, at the end there, and we read that the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers 
are the angels. You know, this world's going to come to an end. God made this world. God placed it here. And when sin came into the world, it actually spoiled it. There is going to be a time when this world will come to an end. And we need to make sure that either before we die or the world comes to an end, that we are saved, that we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour. Now, I'm deliberately making this very simple. There are one or two other things we can talk about with regard to the end of the age and the end of the world, but I just want to keep it nice and simple. This world, which man says is going to go on forever and ever and ever, you'll get some well-known people saying, well, we've got to go to Mars and we've got to go to other places to find somewhere for us to live when this world becomes unlivable. We don't need to worry about any of that. That's not going to happen. There's no other habitable planet in the whole of God's universe. There's just this one, and that's all. I can assure you of that. God has made the universe... And God has made planet Earth as a unique planet. And we can be certain of that. And God is the one who is going to order things on this planet. So all of the things that man has done to it will be reversed in the time to come. So we don't actually need to worry about that. We do need to treat this planet with respect because the Earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I often say on this platform, I always remember a, 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 a preacher that said, after reading that, so we should care for God's world. But man isn't going to destroy this world. We don't need to worry about it. He's not going to destroy it with a big nuclear holocaust or anything like that because God is in control. Man is doing terrible things to man but this world is not going to be destroyed by man. God is going to actually change this world into a wonderful place to live in before he does finally burn it up after that. So God is in control. And we come to this place where it says that the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. So there's going to come a time when God says, I am going to have my harvest. And we read that when this happens, he sends the angels. And they gather out of his kingdom all the things that offend God and those which are sinners that haven't been saved, and they will be cast in picture into a furnace. Remember like those, those weeds that Dinah was all going to be thrown in and burnt up? And there should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now those weeds weren't going to wail, they weren't going to gnash their teeth because they have no feeling. So we see we're talking about people. And this is what's going to happen to those who don't trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. To those that haven't put matters right with God. The Lord Jesus Christ tells a true story, I believe, in um, I think it's Luke chapter 16, I think it is. And we read these words of a man who went to this dreadful place, a place called hell. We read, in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. This is picture language of what he saw. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So although I don't really like to talk about this terrible place, we do need, and I always remember an older brother here many years ago now saying, Ken, you've got to tell people what they need to be safe from. And so what we need to be safe from is this awful place of torment. Here it's pictured for us as a place of fire and torment. And the person that was in there just wanted someone to come and just put a tip of his finger in water and touch it on him to give him just a little bit of relief. It wasn't possible. You can read it for yourself in Luke and chapter 16. And so I bring it before you to see that it is urgent that you are saved, that you escape this awful place that the Bible calls hell, it causes a lake of fire, it causes a pit, it has a number of names for it. And the way you do that is by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour. In contrast, in verse 43, 
We see that the righteous, those that have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour, in God's eyes, they're right with him. They'll shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. And so that's just telling us that they will be seen in the glory that God will give them. And that's a wonderful thing to see. So it's just these two choices. Either we don't trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour, and God will punish us and send us to this awful place. Just like he punished the nation of Israel as old, because they wouldn't obey him, there's this awful punishment that awaits us at the end of our life or at the end of the world if we don't trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour. But of course, as I've already reminded ourselves, there's this wonderful opportunity. Christ died for our sins. He came and showed God's love. He died on the cross. And there we read in the Bible that he was, as it were, punished for our sins. So we can trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour. He's alive now and in heaven. And he wants us to be with him in heaven. And there's no reason why we can't just trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour. So, as I said, we see in verse 43, there were those that experienced the blessing of God because they trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Saviour. So we looked at a past harvest, we've looked at this parable about weeds. And now just a reminder about personal responsibility. First of all, for those who haven't believed, we see it here at the end of verse 43. The Lord Jesus says, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. What does the Lord Jesus mean here? You see, we can hear a story, you can hear me, but you may be a million miles away, as we say, just waiting for the time when I've finished and you can have a cup of tea with us and we'll go home or something like that. But you have a personal responsibility to act on what I've heard. I might have not have told you it very well, but that won't stand up before God. I've sought to warn you to the best of my ability of the fact that God will judge your wrongdoing unless you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour. And that judgment is unpleasant and it goes on forever. So it is important to make sure that you hear and act. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You see, the Lord Jesus accused the people of having ears to hear and not bothering to act on what he said. And so that's the thought behind it. Not only must we hear what the Lord Jesus and God want us to hear, but we must act on what we hear. And if you're not saved from God's judgment on your sin, you must act if you want to be saved. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. But it's also interesting that there are words that talk about a harvest which talk to those who have already trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Saviour. In John 4 and verse 35, we read um, these words. John 4, 35. The Lord Jesus Christ is talking about the need to reach out to those around. He said, don't say there are yet four months and then comes harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. And as I said, as we took the children up to camp yesterday, they were busy harvesting the fields. That thought behind white is that the we often describe corn as golden, but actually as it gets to time to, to be reaped, it's almost losing that gold, golden colour and getting almost a, a whitish goldy colour, isn't it? And so that's the thought behind white and ready to harvest. So those of us who are believers, we shouldn't be saying, oh, there's, we'll harvest, there's a harvest later on. It's we need to look at the fields, the Lord Jesus said, and so they're white and ready to harvest. That's one reason why we have a gospel meeting so that we can tell people about the gospel. It's another reason why we go out and when we can in the summer months and tell others about the fact that they need to be saved. Another reason why we distribute leaflets that tell people they need to be saved and other things that we do. So we thought of a past harvest and the fact that God will always give time and chance, but eventually he punishes sin. We've seen this parable about the weeds. 
And in fact, again, there will come a time when God will have to punish those who haven't trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour. We see it as personal responsibility. You can't blame anyone but yourself if you don't trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour. And for those of us as believers, we need to reach out as much as we possibly can. Shall we just uh, close with a word of prayer? Our God and our Father, we give you thanks then for this time together. We thank you, although perhaps the conditions are difficult, we've been able to once again tell the glad and glorious gospel. We pray that if there are any who are not thine, that they would trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour. And our Father, we would also pray that those of us who are thine would be happy and willing to reach out with the gospel. And in thy will, we pray that thou would bless us in the open air meeting shortly. We thank you for refreshments provided and ask you to bless them to our bodies. And we just ask these things now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to sing a, a couple of verses of...